right now, we're diving into the fireside chat about the founders, their boards, and investors. So once you raise an investment, what happens next? What do you do after it? You have this all investors board, but how to get the most out of it and what to look for when you are selecting a VC? And what does founder friendly mean? I would like to invite on stage Eric Lashi, managing partner at By Founders. Where is Eric? Hello, Eric. And also a moderator, Mike Butcher, editor at large for TechCrunch, to have this great conversation. Have fun, guys. Testing. Ooh, it's oh, it's the mic is on. Yes. The mic is here and the mic is on. Hi, everybody. Who's heard of TechCrunch? Yes, of course you have. Um, Mike Butcher from London. Hope you're having a great time here at Startup Fair. I haven't been back to Lithuania for 10 years. That is terrible, isn't it? So, I'm, but I am pleasantly Things have surprised. Changed. Huh? Things have changed. It's, it's terrible here, really. Don't come. <laughs> Horrible country. Boring city. Everyone's rude. I'm joking. British humor. Okay, right. Let's get into this. Um, so before we start, but everyone, first of all, I want you to, uh, if you're going to the party tonight, if you see me, you've got 10 seconds to pitch me and then you have to buy me a gin and tonic, okay? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I'm kidding around. That can only go wrong. I'm only joking. Um, so, um, Eric Lachey, great to see you. Likewise. You heard a lot about Buy Founders. Um, it's quite interesting fund. Um, you were originally part of the early team at Skype. You were at Trade Shift. That's quite an interesting, interesting one because Trade Shift's been through uh, some interesting times in the last few uh, years. Uh, you, you did Memo Lane, which you sold to HP. You spent eight years in Silicon Valley. So you're an original gangster. How about that? <laughs> He's an actual founder who's now a VC, which is nice, especially in Europe when so many um, uh, wankers, sorry, bankers. Um, <laughs> sorry, just cut that bit, cut that bit. Um, uh, are uh, VCs from b b banking. Um, so um, it's great to have a founder who's an actual uh, uh, VC now. Um, and, but what I want to know is, what is by founders, you know, what do you, what, how do you kind of like pre present it? Yeah, thanks. I think you coined it uh, very well. So I'm part of a generation of Skype and trade shifts and Sendesk community and many other uh, now unicorns that made it fantastic. But if you go out and ask these founders if there's like a common denominator, it was really against all odds. Um, we all were struggling to raise capital. There was very little capital available here in the Nordics and there was never anyone that tried it before. So we were like just continuous making a ton of mistakes because we didn't know better. And what we wanted to do here fast forward uh, was to create a four founders by founders fund, hence the name, of really paying it forward to the next generation of, of ambitious founders in the new Nordics to really not only come with capital, but also bring this arsenal of founders that's all tried it before to help uh, with operational guidance. So we have now 75 of some of the most accomplished uh, founders all invested in our fund, including Tom uh, 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 from here from Lithuania, that's a part of that, and uh, yeah. And I noticed that I was looking at uh, by founders and I was looking at the website and it said something about the new Nordics. <laughs> now, I think I know what the Nordics are, but what are the new new Nordics? So, so from the get-go and also back, back from my experience with Skype, with working very closely with a great team in, in Estonia and, and, and uh, Nicholas from Sweden and Janus from Denmark, it's like what we recognize is that we believe the Baltics is so much more associated, closer associated with us, and hence we actually coined it the new Nordics, as we, we really feel welcome and we feel there's a lot of uh, things we can do where we can make magic together. I, I, I tend to agree. I would also characterize it as us and Russia, and that's it. <laughs> and uh, everyone else, and then Russia. Bye-bye. <laughs> Um, yeah, fuck you, Russian warship. Right. Um, and uh, relationship between inv founders and investors. So um, I think what we need to do is let's do a little bit of stuff about like when you deal with founders. Right? So let's try and keep it real because I think everybody has to go through this process. 
and I think you know, we've all heard the terms, it's like a marriage, um, and then you get divorced, or you, you know, you have great kids. Um, it, you, you know, what, what's the, what, how do you characterize it? Because, I mean, what, for instance, when, when an entrepreneur says to you, um, you know, when somebody asks you advice and then you're not going to invest in them, uh, what do you say, what, you know, when they say, what should I look for in a VC, mm-hmm. um, what do you say? Yeah, so I, I think it's, there's definitely been a transition or a, a, a change. As you said, there was a lot of bankers in the past. And, uh, and now I think we've seen much more a level head of more and more founders and operators that become involved in VCs. Hence, they can provide much more advice and so on. I think at the core, when you're looking for an investor, you want to make sure that they have conviction, that they really are, are, are resonating one-to-one on the vision and ambition that you have, that you have that. Uh, secondly is like that they have the competencies like are they really competent about what they're talking about you would hate to see that somebody you decide to partner with for the next 10 years actually has very little insight to what you do we often turn down what we you could say were great investments but where we just simply say we don't know how we can help we don't we are not the one that would be the best to carry you through this and hence, we step out of that, right? Mm. Uh, then so you, are you saying that you, you, you want to make a commitment? If you make a commitment, you really are you're in it for, you know, you, you're really going to go deep. because Like crazy deep. Yeah. And which yeah. is also just a, a little bit of, like, when we, as by founders, uh, we invest. We have published our term sheet on, on, on a website uh, to be fully transparent. Mm. But in one of them, we show... We invest in common shares, not we don't take liquidation preferences. What does that mean? That means that we invest alongside the founders at the same risk level. We go all in. Either we go up or we fucking fail together. There's not this middle ground that, oh, now we want to take our money back and you are like, whatever. So this is really... So common shares... And is that, I mean, I think I've heard that a few times in, in London and amongst some investors. Do you think that's becoming a more pre- preferent, preferent, preference or a, a more of a wave of, of amongst investors? I, or is it or is, is it still quite a minor part of the market? We, we, we see that in the early stage, it's starting to, to go through. We see a later stage, there's still the old school bankers that want their liquidation preferences. And then we also see that during the current situation, what's happening now is that more investors are becoming you know, more risk averse and they are starting to uh, impose liquidation preferences uh, in the term sheets again, which they yeah. have been a little bit more. I want to, I want to talk about that subject yeah. later. Yes. But what, it, it, uh, uh, once, okay, you've done. You've got the investment. You're doing. The, you've done the deal. Now, what you do? You know, what? It, how do you get the? How does an entrepreneur get the best out of their investors? What sort of questions should they ask them? So, I actually, I think it's one of the things when you meet with 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 the investors. Exactly. Be careful that it's not just you talking. Ask the yeah. investors questions. Like interrogate them. Like really is saying, why do you think this is interesting for you? Like, what are the things we could learn? From our side, one of the things we, we use uh, that we have coined the ugly slide. So when we look at in investing in founders, we're looking for passion, we're looking for love, and we're looking for the ugly slide. So what is that? We're looking for founders with passion, we're looking for products that people love, and then we're looking for the ugly slide. We ask people, so what is it that keeps uh, founders up at night? How can we help? Because all the nice talk about pitches, 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 and so on. It's mm. just sales, selling yeah. a used car. When it really comes to the core of it, what is it that keeps you up at night? That's where we listen and hear how we can help. Again, coming back to, do we, can we get conviction and can we see how we can help? Often, we have founders that are saying, I'm all good. It's going great. We don't have competition. We don't have anything, whatever. And for sure, if there's two things that we uh, look at, like if a founder is either lying or he's ignorant about his own business, we would never invest. Right. So that's why we ask for the Oculus slide. There's no startup without a board. Um, yes. And um, what's the best way of thinking about a board? Is it kind of like air traffic control? Is it is it there to kind of give you advice on how to run the business? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and you know, what sort of things should you look for? Things like diversity. What are the th- some of your thoughts? Yeah, exactly. I think. Um, for us, 
we very make very clear to any founder that we invest in that we sit to serve. We say it very clearly. We sit on the board as long as you feel that we add value. The one day do you feel that we are wasting your time in a board meeting, in anything of activity that we are providing, just let us know and we will step out. Then we have really not fulfilled what we wanted to do. So we sit there to serve and we are not there to control. Like it is not for you to, to come and try to impress us in a board meeting. No, it is for you to be 100% transparent about what's going on and what is the need you have. We often see founders, they, they waste their own and our time by coming to the meeting, uh, maybe unprepared, but at least saying, okay, we spent two hours going through all the numbers. That's not what we are all about. What you do is three, four days ahead of the board meeting, you send the presentation with the numbers and you say, dear investor, if you have any questions to the numbers, I'm happy to address that in the meeting. Otherwise, what I would like to use the board meeting for is these two or three strategic yeah. questions that I really would like to have a detailed, thorough conversation about what we should do. Yeah. And that brings so much more value out, right? And then coming back to the composition of the board. You Don't know, be in a board meeting sitting there looking at numbers. It's like, no, it's idea. such a waste of time. And it's such a waste of time of having somebody that have like prepared slides and then go slide by slide and talks about them. We can read, we can read, and, and we would be happy to, you know, address if there are things that where we see red flags, we don't need a narrative around it. Mm. So, so just like figuring out how you spend the most time. Yeah. But again, on your board, you know, one thing is, Really make sure if you have the opportunity to choose, find investors that you feel could add value to you and know this space can help you with connections, opening up, and ev eventually also have capital, of course. But uh, what we often do at By Founders, given the way we are structured, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we go back, sorry, we go back and say to the founders, I don't need to sit on the board because I believe somebody else in our group of founders that's involved in our group will be much better fit. So for example, if anybody knows Vivino, the app Vivino, so we invested in a dating app on Iceland called Smitten and they really need to figure out app engagement. So we asked Heine, who's the co-founder of Vivino, if he could sit on the board instead of me and then you know, they had a conversation, magic happened, and that's how we do it. Right. And, and we have many examples of that. And also, I think, you, I think you probably agree that you can increase the diversity of your board by saying some, I, some board members are, are allowed to be remote, right? So, yes. you know, the, you'll, you'll increase more gender diversity, ethnicity. Absolutely. So, I, yeah. I think the COVID have had many crazy yeah. things, but the good thing is that we realize there is a remote first uh, environment. And where you have an opportunity now, you don't need to have your board sitting here in Vilnius. You can have your board sitting anywhere where you can handpick the best board members. And you should also look at, like when you're looking at angels, go out, find the best uh, angel investors anywhere in the world, but board members for particular as well, and then bring them on as well. And then look for diversity. Don't create the bro culture. It's, it's yeah. like, if it starts at the board level, guess what? It's also at the executive level and it's in the whole uh, organization and it's just toxic. So really find ways to create inclusion and diversity. That's a really, that's really good advice. Um, okay, right. Okay, breaking news. We're all fucked. Um, there's <laughs> going to be a recession. Uh, there's uh, there's going to be a downturn and LPs are withdrawing funds from uh, the VCs. Um, uh, uh, startup valuations are plummeting. What do we do now? What's going to happen next? Do you know? <laughs> uh, if I knew I wouldn't be here. Uh, no, I think, I think it's, to some extent, it's a good reset that we are seeing right now because, for example, 2021 has been super overheated and overheated and, and valuation has just skyrocketed. And I think for those who are just out there now starting their company and, and going out, I think it's, it's all, you know, 
business as usual in the sense of they need to prove what they are building and getting great investors on board. For those who already raised last year, for example, at very high valuations, they will really need to look to preserve capital because right now the valuations have almost halved and, and it will be difficult to then not have a down round, which is nobody wants that, right? So yeah. overall- Down rounds are bad. Yes. Overall, I think Google down rounds. our advice right now to anyone that's running a startup is preserve cash. Like, make sure you can hold water, like your uh, you can breath underwater for a longer period of time because for the next 18 months at least, it will be a very turbulent space. Yeah. And the VCs, we will be very cautious of how we deploy capital because eventually we will also need to have to raise capital and our LPs will also be very cautious of how they deploy capital. Um, just a quick note, by the way, uh, guys, you can uh, put questions on this Slido thing if you want to do that, uh, but it's, make sure it's a good one, otherwise I won't read it out. Um, but what else is going on? Uh, so LPs withdrawing, I mean, but you know, kind of, let's face it, you know, um, the VCs part contributed to the problem by boosting valuations in the last couple of <laughs> years, didn't they? So, yes. But valuations kind of went sky high. Um, don't you accept some responsibility for that? I, I think there's definitely been, um, we've seen over the last couple of years, a number of, like it, I would push the responsibility on the late stage. Uh, hedge funds that have really gone in and, and deployed a lot of capital in the private market, but suddenly as they've seen the public market go down like 30% or more, in their balance, they now are overexposed in the private market and they are stopping every activity there. And as they stop there, suddenly a lot of companies that were supposed to do like pre-IPO financing and so on are not getting there. And suddenly the other investors that's been carrying them are knowing that we need to carry them for a longer period of time because there's not the capital available. So they are also saying, hey, we need to make the uh, readjustment of how much we do follow on investments to carry the, the companies we backed. And suddenly they are not doing new investments and hence we need to carry the portfolio companies that we've invested in for a longer period of time. So it trickles down and yes, the valuations have absolutely not helped to an environment now where it's like, like at the perfect storm, everything comes together and, and it will be difficult. Right, I see, yeah. Lastly, um, what's your impression? Because my impression, I've, I've been to, I went to Tech Chill, I skipped um, Latitude. Latitude 59, um, and now I'm here. And I'm getting kind of a feeling like um, that, you know, the whole of the Baltic, Baltic region is really exploding with talent and startups right now. In particular, I've been pretty impressed with what I've seen here in Lithuania so far. What are your impressions as, as, a, um, as, a, as an investor in, about the Baltics? Like from the get-go, when we started by founders and why we set the new Nordic, it was important to include the Baltics yeah. into the geo where we invest because we are just seen, uh, led of course by Estonia, uh, like an uprise, an incredible uprise. Like looking at the population, you have three million and you basically have almost made as many unicorns as, 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 as Denmark and or Estonia that has eight or some says 10 unicorns in the population of 1.2 million. And like France have a, the same amount of unicorns that they are 65 million. I think the benefit that really you have is very, very high level of education. People are super smart. You are like basically also saying like, this is the way you can prove yourself mm. and hence you're ambitious. And then the third thing is that similar to Denmark where I'm from, we will, you will never be satisfied in serving your local market. Many French, many German, many British founders, they are like comfortable of saying, I made it in the UK, it's yeah. fine. So they don't think out of the box. You are from the get go thinking, I need to be a global uh, startup, otherwise yeah. I won't succeed. Yeah, I think the secret reason is you're just getting bored of Copenhagen and this is a lot more fun. Yes. Great, right. well thank you very much, Eric Lash from uh, Bifounders. My name's Mike Butcher.